forward to seventy percent. So, I just, just to be clear that it's the upgrades, not the upgrades. Let me assess. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Hart. I am your uh, relatively new town manager. I've been here eight months or so, and I'm very, uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for coming to this afternoon's forum regarding the, uh, the Yukon property, its former West Hartford campus. Um, I know that it's a a very warm and pleasant day outside, yet you have all come to this session. So I think that's really a testament to your dedication and uh, your interest, your interest in this project and in the property. Uh, before I go much further, I'd like to read a short welcome statement from our mayor, Sherry Cantor. So the mayor says, welcome and thank you for attending tonight's community visioning forum for the future of the Yukon West Hartford campus. This is a fabulous turnout. We appreciate your interest and your commitment to the future of our community. In West Hartford, the town council serves as the chief zoning authority on certain land use applications with support from our town plan and zoning commission as well as town staff. And at the advice of the town's attorney, the town council will not be participating in tonight's forum in order to ensure that we avoid any conflict of interest with our zoning or our land use role. The town council does take that role and its other responsibilities very seriously. As many of you know, this past December, the town council decided to terminate our purchase and sale agreement with Yukon for the purchase of the 58 acre campus. We made this decision for a variety of reasons, but chief among them was the concern that the town as a municipal government was not in the best position to finance and manage the environmental cleanup of the site, especially during these challenging financial times. However, given the location, size, and redevelopment potential of the campus, the council remains keenly interested in shaping the future of this parcel. As stated earlier, the town council is the town's chief land use authority and would need to approve any change to the zoning of the property. In addition, the town has constructed ball fields on land that it leases on the eastern side of the campus, and we have an interest in maintaining those fields. Given our continuing interest in the property, the town council authorized our economic development subcommittee to initiate this community engagement effort to seek public input regarding potential uses and redevelopment scenarios for the campus property. Your input and feedback will help the council prepare a community vision for the future of the site. This community vision 
will be informative for any future buyer of the campus and will also be an important resource for the town council if we need to make any land use decisions regarding the site. In closing, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues on the council, Deputy Mayor Beth Kerrigan and Minority Leader Chris Barnes, as well as Councilors Leon Davidoff, Dallas Dodge, Mary Fay, Liam Sweeney, Ben Wenigrad, and Chris Williams, and thank them for their leadership and their support with this process. We greatly appreciate your participation in tonight's forum. Sincerely, Sherry Cantor, Mayor, Town of West Hartford. So that's uh, a welcome letter from our mayor, and it explains why the town council is, uh, is not here this evening. So let's get started with our presentation. I am joined here tonight by our town planner, Todd Dumay, as well as Patrick Gallagher from the firm of Milona McBroom. We will be the three people making the formal presentation. We have a PowerPoint that's gonna run about 45 minutes or so, and then we're gonna have some breakout sessions after that. And we're gonna handle Q&A during the breakout sessions. Uh, tonight, I want to make it very clear, tonight is not an official public hearing. Uh, this is a community engagement effort. This is more of an, an, an informal process where we want to share some information with you, share some potential scenarios with you, but more importantly, hear your opinion as well. So what we're planning to cover tonight. Um, first, with respect to uh, the presentation itself, we're gonna cover a little bit of the background of our work regarding the property and talk about the purpose, the purpose of this community engagement effort. You know, we've got three sessions tonight. Uh, we also have been conducting an online survey. Um, over 2,000 people have, uh, have responded, which is just, uh, just great. Uh, so we'll talk about the, the purpose of this effort. And then we'll transition uh, to talking about the campus, the campus itself. Uh, the environmental conditions that we have found during our due diligence, et cetera. Then we will transition into a conversation about various hypothetical, hypothetical development concepts and impact assessments related, related to those concepts. Then we will conduct an interactive survey where all of you will have a chance to use your little clickers and, and vote on various scenarios and then we will have our three breakout sessions. And that's where we will handle uh, uh, Q&A uh, during, during those sessions. So moving forward, uh, let me talk a little bit about the background of the town's work thus far regarding the campus property. So in 2015, folks will recall, the university announced its plans to relocate the West Hartford campus to downtown Hartford. And this relocation, you know, it took a little bit of time, but it was completed uh, this past August in, uh, in 17. In the summer of 16, the university and the town entered into a purchase and sale agreement. It was a conditional purchase and sale agreement that was subject to what we call a due diligence period. And a due diligence period allows a prospective buyer uh, to research the property, um, ascertain any issues, what condition it's in, uh, whether, what condition the title might be in, et cetera. And we did extend the due diligence period uh, several times. You know, we, uh, we had to do that because we felt as though we needed the time to conduct our review. And it's important for the town representing the interests of the community at large, it was important for us to take time to do our research and to look into this property in some detail. So the tasks that we covered during this due diligence period, they included survey work, we looked at the wetlands, um, we did various, performed some environmental reviews, as well as some developmental analysis much of which we'll get into a little bit later during this presentation. 
So following this due diligence effort, and again, we extended it uh, several times, this past December, the council decided to terminate the purchase and sale agreement with the university and not move forward with the straight purchase. And again, the primary concern that the council noted was a concern that the town as a municipal organization was not in the best position, especially during these financial times, to take on the cost and the burden of uh, potential remediation for the site. And that we would be better working with the private sector on that process. As I talked about during the mayor's welcome letter, the town council does remain very interested in the future of the parcel. That's why we're conducting this community engagement effort. And the university, you know, while this is going on, the university is currently marketing the site to prospective developers, as we've listed up here. And as they've stated on their website, they are willing to consider a sale to any buyer for any use. However, uh, as a staff, we are in pretty close communication uh, with the university, with key administrators there who are handling this project. Uh, we constantly talk about the town's long-term interest in this process, and the university has continued to express an interest in working cooperatively with the town, despite the fact that we terminated the, uh, the purchase and sale agreement. So now I am going to turn the microphone over to our town planner, Mr. Dumay, who's going to cover the next several slides, and then we'll hear from Patrick. And we do have a, uh, a microphone here so that we're picked up on uh, West Hartford Public TV. It's just going to take a moment or two to switch. Just one housekeeping item. For those of you that didn't get a chance to ask, um, you may have gotten a parking validation card on your way in. Um, great, I'm glad that you did. On the way out, hopefully the gates are gonna be up. We're told they'll be up, so you don't have to worry about validating parking. I just wanted to make that statement before we continue. So what is our project purpose? Um, through this effort, through this community engagement effort, we hope to understand the community's sentiment regarding potential future uses of the Yukon campus and assess those potential opportunities and identify what the concerns of the community are with any of those potential opportunities. Uh, it is the hope of the council that we can develop a community supported vision for the Yukon campus through this public engagement process. Uh, we've already done a online survey and we've had a phenomenal response over 2700 participants that gave us a lot of really good information and feedback. Uh, tonight's forums are one of an additional uh, one of many forums that we're going to hold. We have another forum or event scheduled later in March, most likely with the Bishop's Corner Neighborhood Association uh, that will be a, a similar format as that, that which we're doing tonight. In addition, anyone is available to submit public comments directly to myself. Uh, my contact information will be on the last slide of the presentation, and I've received several dozen written comments both uh, in the mail and via email. After all of this, it's, as I stated, the town council plans to adopt a community vision. The draft vision statement for the Yukon campus should be based on the input received through this process, and we hope to refine and, uh, based on the feedback we have tonight. Uh, the town council will hopefully adopt a community vision statement, which will assist Yukon in marketing the property and inform prospective developers and then also guide the council as uh, Mr. Hart stated in any future land use decisions. So through our due diligence efforts, what have we learned about the campus today? Some of the information we've known, um, some of it we learned for the first time. So about the campus buildings and grounds, uh, the town and UConn both conducted environmental assessing, assessments, testing specifically on the buildings grounds throughout the UConn campus. 
Various exterior building materials were tested and have been determined to contain PCBs. Um, unfortunately, this is a relatively common uh, occurrence for buildings of the age and vintage uh, as on the campus. The PCBs have leached out of the building materials and are now present in the surrounding soils. Um, PCBs tend to be present where the upper few inches of soils um, if, if they haven't migrated further. In general, the PCBs are present in the areas immediately around the buildings, but also on some adjacent surfaces of concrete um, around the buildings as well. Uh, UConn has performed some soil remediation in areas where it was deemed necessary and is continuing to evaluate the site conditions. All site evaluation and cleanup is being directed by the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection under the direction and guidance of the Environmental Protection Agency. During this due diligence process, um, we also looked at what would it cost for the town to abate and demolish the existing buildings. Uh, based on our analysis, we believe that the total cost to abate and demolish the buildings on the campus would exceed $5,500,000. Uh, this cost, I should point out, does not include several items, principally remediation of site contaminants or removal of site improvements, such as sidewalks and parking areas. What else do we know about the campus? Well, we know some fiscal impacts. Uh, currently, UConn, the campus, the state of Connecticut, it's tax exempt. Um, it doesn't generate tax revenue. Uh, the state contributes funds via the state's payment in lieu of program, also known as the pilot program. Uh, the buildings and property are appraised at $34.8 million. That's the appraised value. There's been some recent information uh, in the press. The, the assessed value is 70% is that amount. Um, if the property were to come onto the tax rolls to jet today under the current appraisal, uh, it would generate approximately $1 million in tax revenue. Uh, it's the position of town management that some opportunity for grand list growth potential exists on the campus. And I would like to just point out, and you can see a little footnote up there, that currently uh, UConn, and Mr. Hart has mentioned this um, to several of you preceding this event, has filed an appeal against the town's appraised value on the campus. Okay, orientation. Uh, it's important to orient everyone to the site. The map up here, north is up top, south where we are down here. North Main Street, just off to our left, uh, University of St. Joseph. Um, so the campus is essentially divided by Trout Brook Drive. We know that. Um, the east side is approximately 24 and a half acres. The west side, 33 and a half acres. Most of the um, substantial improvements, all of the buildings, are contained on the west side of the campus. The majority of the site parking is contained on the east side of the campus. And the ball fields, that area that Mr. Hart talked about, and it's the council's intent and the town's intent, are located in the southeast triangle, um, south and east of the St. Joseph Brook. That's the small water course that runs right here. This larger, larger water course is a tributary of the Trout Brook. Many of you may be aware, and this has been evidenced by some relatively recent flooding events, that much of the campus is subject to uh, flooding. Uh, the campus has been mapped by FEMA um, in several flood hazard zones. So what you see in the map up here is FEMA special flood hazard mapping area. There are three zones. There's a 500 year flood zone depicted in yellow or orange. Then there are two other flood zones and they're both considered the 100 year flood zone. Those are the flood zones you see in blue. Those are considered regulatory, meaning that um, development in those is more difficult, um, if not impossible in some circumstances. Uh, in total, all of the areas in blue, so the special flood hazard or the regulatory, comprise about 7.7 .7 acres of the site. That's about 13% of the entire parcel. Through our wetland delineation report, um, we've had the opportunity through our consultant to go out and field delineate wetlands. Our current GIS mapping and wetlands delineation wasn't based on an on-site soil survey. So we knew that we needed to go out and determine what was out in the field. The map you see behind me shows what was delineated. So anything in the, the lavender or the pink is a regulated resource. And what is a regulated resource? That could be a number of things. It could be a brook, water course, the pond, or a wetland soil type. That, those are all the areas in purple. In total, that's 12.6 acres of the site. 
or approximately 21% of the site, close to 22% of the site is a regulated resource. Again, that means that any development occurring in those areas uh, has to meet certain thresholds and would have to be reviewed by our town inland wetland agency. Just outside our inland wetland um, regulated areas is what's called an upland review area. So on this map, that's this double yellow line and it's basically a buffer around the regulated resource. It extends 150 feet from the wetland, from the water course or from the pond. Any activity within that area is considered regulated and has to go before our town's inland wetland agency for review to determine any potential impacts um, to the regulated resource. In total, we call those two areas um, regulated. And in total, wetland and the upland review were at 42 and a half, nearly 42 and a half acres. That's about 73% of the campus is in some form of regulated resource. Um, I would point out that the wetland assessment identified varying degrees of wetlands. So not all wetlands are created equal. Um, there is an assessment that provides for functions and values of the wetland resource. What you see here is the highest functions and values wetlands are, are principally on the east side of the campus along that St. John Brook, and they're mostly forested wetlands. Um, there's a large swath of wetland over here, uh, evidenced by this picture that was classified as a wet meadow. But if you were to visit the campus today, um, you wouldn't be able to distinguish that from just a maintained lawn, and it's been maintained as a lawn space for decades. What's the other uh, piece of land use information that we know about the campus? It is zoning. Uh, currently, the property is zoned and has been zoned for many decades as single family zoning. The current zoning is R10 single family, and we've highlighted two principal uses that are permitted in that, and one of those is single family residential. Uh, the other, oddly enough, is a farm use. Other uses are permitted um, in that zone, and we call those uses permitted via a special exception that would be granted through a special use permit from our Town Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, we listed a few of those potential uses. Those could be institutional uses, such as religious institutions, schools, libraries, obviously universities, um, nursery, greenhouse, child care centers, uh, veterinary centers, a cemetery, or public parks. All of those fall under the umbrella of a special permit use that could be approved on the site through its own public hearing and its own regulatory approval through our Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, I would point out that the campus obviously is, uh, had been maintained as an institutional in University of Connecticut. Um, that use, because it was state-owned and state-run, never went through uh, a local jurisdictional review because the state is exempt from local municipal zoning. So even though that campus exists there today, it didn't go through our local permitting process. What did go through the local permitting process are the ball fields um, on the southeast corner. So any public park has to go through our local permitting process here in town. Um, with that, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Pat Gallagher of Malone and McBroom, and he's going to walk everyone through some development assessments. Thanks everybody for coming out tonight. My name is Pat Gallagher. I'm with Mylona McBroom. And now we're going to get into some information on potential reuse of the site. And as the town manager mentioned before, these are all hypothetical in nature and really intended to provide you all with a little more information and to provide the town council with a little more information as you um, assist UConn in the marketing process coming forward. So one thing um, that you'll notice on both the boards and in the slides that I'll show you is that we've divided the campus into an east side and a west side and the west side being the larger of the two. Um, and the east side, we further split in half. We have um, what we're calling the preservation area, which is surrounding the ball fields. We know it's very important that the town maintain that as a community use. And then we also have a development area on the east side covering the northern portion of that area, um, which we'll show you some development concepts on. This also helps point out the fact that there may not be a one-size-fits-all development for the site. Uh, it's a large site, and it could support uh, a mix of uses, perhaps, with different uses being on the east and the west side of the campus. 
So as I mentioned before, these are all meant to be hypothetical in nature and really meant to show what could uh, go on the campus and what are the impacts associated with those different uses. Uh, none of the uses that you're about to see are recommendations, uh, nor are they proposed. And as Todd mentioned before, any future development is going to have to go through all of the federal, state, and local regulatory approvals as part of this process. Um, I'll introduce the concepts over the next few minutes, and then we'll have a more detailed discussion and some Q&A about them when we break out uh, in a little while. So to help give you all some additional information, um, we took, um, we actually created some development concepts. So we put a building and a parking area on the site, and then we quantified the impacts associated. So that includes the number of parking spaces, how much traffic could be generated, uh, fiscal impact, so how much tax revenue it'll generate, and how much it will cost the town and uh, services. We classify uses as either a positive fiscal impact, in uh, which they would generate more in revenue than they'd cost in services, a neutral, where taxes and services about offset, and negatives, which cost more in town services than they produce in tax revenue. We looked at impervious cover, which covers um, buildings, sidewalks, parking areas, anything that doesn't absorb rain. And we know that flooding is an issue with the theme of flood zones. Um, and so we quantified whether impervious cover would increase or decrease. And finally, uh, letting you know whether the use is permitted under your current zoning or whether a zone change is needed. So we'll start with a baseline, knowing that um, when the Yukon campus was active, it did have significant impacts on the surrounding neighborhood. It has five buildings totaling almost 200,000 square feet, ranging anywhere from one to three stories, a significant number of parking spaces, over 1,000 parking spaces, with most of those being located on the east side of the campus. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have traffic numbers generated from the campus itself. However, we were able to estimate them based on the uh, ITE trip generation manual, which is the industry standard for estimating traffic. And um, we estimate there's uh, several thousand trips on weekdays and uh, 1,250 trips on a Saturday. So pretty sizable traffic impacts. Uh, as mentioned earlier, this property is tax exempt, so it is not generating any revenue from the town. However, it's also not using any town services, not producing school children. They have their own um, public safety, et cetera. And as mentioned, this is permitted under current zoning. We anticipate that if um, the campus is reused for an institutional or educational use, uh, the impacts would be similar to those that existed when it was active. So now we're going to show you a few concepts on the east side development area. And this covers about 10 acres. And again, we've excluded the ball fields and some parking, which we assume is needed to support the ball fields. So when the town was conducting its due diligence process and was interested in purchasing the property, uh, one of the concepts that we developed was a town park. Um, again, this is dependent on the town owning the property. Uh, we estimate that in order to do a town park just on the east side would cost in the range of two or three million dollars, and that does not include the cost to acquire the property, demolition of any existing buildings or pavement, remediation of the site, design or maintenance costs. So, um, a park would have um, significant cost to the town. We would estimate that it would have about 200 to 250 parking spaces and produce a modest amount of traffic, but definitely decreased over what exists today. Um, however, this would be a fiscal negative for the town in that um, it would have uh, maintenance and upkeep costs um, and would not produce any tax revenue for the town. Next, we look at single family residential. This is one of the uses that is permitted under your current zoning and regulations. And this is, um, per, uh, besides the park, the least intense use that we're showing you tonight. Um, we estimate we could fit about 18 single family homes on the east side. And you'll notice in all of the concepts that we are working around the wetlands. We're not proposing any developments or parking areas in the regulated wetlands, which are highlighted in this lighter green. Um, as I mentioned, Definitely uh, among the least intense uses uh, in terms of traffic, very low traffic compared to what exists on the campus today. However, one of the cons of single family homes is that they are, they are a net fiscal negative in that they cost the town more in services, uh, notably because they produce a lot of school age kids than they produce in tax revenue. The next concept is condominiums and townhomes. And this has similar impacts to single family residential, but um, they're slightly more intense because there are a greater number of units. Um, we have 30 units showed on the concept here today. 
Again, traffic generation is on the lower end of the concepts that we're going through today. Um, while townhomes produce less school-age kids than single-family homes, nonetheless, we anticipate this would be a fiscal negative use and cost more in town services than it produces in taxes. And th this use uh, could be permitted under current zoning, however, it would require an open space development special use permit approval. So now we're going to get into uses that are not permitted under current zoning, and we'll start by looking at multifamily apartments. Um, the concept shown here is 120 units, a mix of one and two bedrooms at three stories and with 200 parking spaces. Um, you'll note that the traffic is um, substantially higher than single family residential or condominiums or townhomes um, at 650 weekday trips, 800 weekend trips, and that the property tax generation is also higher. Apartments tend to not produce many school aged children and therefore this is a neutral fiscal impact in that It'll cost the town about the same in town services as it produces in revenue. And as I mentioned, this use and all the uses on the next few slides will require a, a zone change. All right, next is assisted living. Um, depicted on the map is a 120 unit assisted living facility with two stories and 65 parking spaces. This is the lowest intensity non-residential use that we're showing this evening. Uh, you'll notice that traffic generated from assisted living facilities is on the lower side, more comparable with single family residential. This would produce about $400,000 in property tax revenue and would be a fiscal positive. Really the main difference being commercial uses don't produce school aged children and therefore um, produce more in uh, tax revenue than they cost the town in services. And this would require a zone change. Next is a hotel. The proposed hotel here is 130 rooms, three stories, and has 160 parking spaces. Uh, you'll notice that this has uh, substantially more traffic impacts, over 1,000 weekday trips, um, and would produce slightly more tax revenue, um, but not much more than an assisted living facility. Again, this would be a positive fiscal impact and would require a zone change. So you'll, you'll notice there are pros and cons to each. Um, some are fiscal, uh, fiscal positives but have very high traffic impacts and vice versa. So that's some of the things we want to discuss with you later when we break out. Moving on to office, um, depicted on the map is 80,000 square feet with two, uh, in two buildings of two stories each and 400 parking spaces, so a much larger footprint than some of the other commercial uses. Um, offices produce uh, a moderate amount of traffic. However, if it's a medical office, it will produce um, a high level of traffic. So that's why we have 850 plus. Um, if it was a medical office, it would produce more than 850 trips on a weekday. Um, again, it would be a fiscal positive because it, it, is, it is a commercial development and it would require a zone change. All right, next is retail. Um, depicted as a 45,000 square foot building. Um, we sized it similar to a grocery store, uh, one story with 250 parking spaces. This is the highest traffic generating use of any of the uses that you'll see tonight. And you'll note it produces similar property tax revenue um, as the other commercial concepts that we are showing. Um, impervious cover remains about the same. Uh, the east side is mostly parking, um, and so it would remain mostly parking under this scenario. And it would require a zone change. And the last east side concept is commercial recreation. Um, this is um, intended to be a field house style concept, uh, about 113,000 square feet. 50 to 60 foot high building with 170 parking spaces. Again, this is a high traffic generating use um, with up to 3,100 trips, and it would be a, a use that would have more traffic on the weekends compared to the weekdays. Commercial recreation tends to produce less tax revenue compared to other commercial uses, um, but would nonetheless be a fiscal positive. And this would also require a zone change. So now we'll get into the west side development area, and this is a much larger um, piece of property at over 33 acres. So um, like the east side, um, we'll show you the town park concept that we developed during the due diligence process. Again, this, in order for this to move forward, um, it would require the town to own the property. Um, because it's a larger piece of land, estimated construction cost is three to four million dollars. But again, that doesn't factor in cost to acquire the land, demolish the existing buildings, remediate uh, both the site uh, buildings and the soil, as well as uh, design and ongoing maintenance costs. So again, a, a very, um, very costly um, endeavor if this were to go forward. This would be more of a passive park 
whereas the east side had more um, recreation. Um, and so traffic impacts would be lower compared to the east side. But again, this would not produce any tax revenue for the town. It would end up being a fiscal negative. So we'll show a few more concepts, and these are repeats of the east side, but they are on the west side. And so um, you know, really the main difference is that the impacts will generally be the same, but they are um, larger. So for example, single family homes still produce the least amount of traffic, but the amount of traffic is substantially higher than the east side simply because we can fit a lot more single family homes. We can fit 39 on the east side, or on the west side, excuse me. Moving on to condominiums and townhomes, we can fit 72 under the concept shown. Um, again, higher traffic than single family, um, and, but still on the lower end, and a um, net fiscal negative for the town. Multifamily apartments, um, shown is 260 um, rental apartments at a mix of one and two bedrooms uh, and 400 parking spaces. Uh, again, this produces more tax revenue compared to the other residential uses, but also has higher traffic impacts uh, and is a fiscal neutral uh, in that we're not expecting to see a lot of school-aged children coming from apartment housing. This would require a zone change. Office uses, again, have the largest footprint just because they require um, a lot of parking spaces. And so you'll see um, in gray is the area that we um, anticipate we would need for parking under this hypothetical scenario. Um, this shows about 200,000 square feet of building area, so similar to what exists in the campus buildings today. However, we would need all of that parking on the west side of the campus to support it rather than on the east side. Again, this is a, a high traffic generating use, over 2,000 um, trips per weekday, but higher if it is medical office. Um, again, being a fiscal positive, um, but requiring a zone change. And finally, um, when we looked at retail and assisted living, we didn't think it made sense to make the entire site just assisted living or the entire site retail just because it is so large. Um, and so we did a mix of the two. And so this would be a 45,000 square foot um, retail facility and 120 bed assisted living facility. Again, because it has the retail, it would be a very high traffic generating use um, and would produce about $600,000 in property taxes annually. Uh, ultimately, the west side could potentially be subdivided into um, more than one parcel and could potentially be developed into more than one use. And this scenario would require a zone change. So the next concept is identical. However, we flip-flopped the locations of the two with the retail being in the northern end and the assisted living being in the southern end with access off of Asylum Avenue. Um, the impacts are exactly the same, but we know that that's going to be one of the the things that we want to hear from you tonight is um, you know, how, how these fit in with the surrounding residential neighborhood. So just to summarize, I, I know there's probably a lot of questions and comments, and uh, when we break out, um, we'd love to talk to you more about these different options that we ran through tonight. So just to summarize, um, any future development, whether it's something that's on the board uh, today or not, will need to go through all of the necessary federal, state, and local approvals, including zoning and inland wetlands. Um, these concepts that we presented tonight also don't encompass the range of potential possibilities. There are other options out there that may come up um, as Yukon markets the site. Um, and again, reiterating that what happens on the east side doesn't necessarily need to be the same thing that happens on the west side. There could be a mix of different uses. And again, we want to hear more from you when we break up into smaller groups. So now um, we're going to do some audience polling. and. Um, we were passing those out at the sign-in sheet. If you do not have a little um, plastic thing with the five buttons, if you could please raise your hand and we'll pass out a few. So we have one over here. So how this will work is everyone will have a keypad and it has five choices, one through five or A to B. Uh, the questions are all um, one to five. And we're gonna throw a series of questions up on the screen and um, we'll have probably 15 to 20 seconds for each question. There will be a clock in the lower right-hand corner counting down from 10. Once it hits zero, the uh, voting is closed on that question. If you change your mind, um, whichever button you press last will be the answer that's recorded. So just to get everyone comfortable, um, and actually are we, uh, we'll so, um, each question will have the choices laid out on the screen. 
Um, so just pick whatever one aligns with the answer that um, you think is best. So I think we're all set. So we'll start with a practice question just to get everyone, uh, give it, uh, everyone a chance to participate. And as a West Hartford resident, I am very curious, um, which baseball team is better? And I am gonna advance it and you'll notice the clock, 10 second countdown. So a few seconds left. That's disappointing. <laughs> but nonetheless, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. So it seems like every, uh, they're, they're all working, um, so we'll, we'll move on to more substantive questions. So question one, how far do you live from the Yukon campus? It seems like a mix. We have a lot of neighbors. We have a, a decent number of folks who live between one and three miles and a lot who live uh, in the more um, uh, one to three mile range in town. All right, question two. The Yukon campus presents an opportunity for the town of West Hartford to grow its tax base. There seems to be general agreement that the Yukon campus is an opportunity for the town to grow its tax base. Um, as we break up into smaller groups, I'd love to hear the 12% um, who were disagreed or strongly disagreed. I'd love to hear the, the reasons behind that. All right, next question. The properties on the east side and west side of Trapwork Drive should be treated as separate development areas. There's again seems to be general agreement. All right, next question. The ball fields, basketball court, and playground on the corner of Troutbrook Drive and Asylum Avenue should be retained for community use. All right, this is our strongest agreement yet. So 66% strongly agree. All right, next question. Any future development or redevelopment of the campus should maintain green spaces to the greatest extent possible, especially in areas that border single family residences. Again, a very strong agreement. All right, next question. Any future development or redevelopment of the campus should include publi ex publicly accessible green spaces for community use to the greatest extent possible. There is strong agreement, however, a little less strong than the previous two questions. All right, future development should have similar building and parking setbacks to those that exist on the campus today. All right, there seems to be very mixed opinions on this one. So um, again, something we love to discuss when we're in those smaller breakout sessions. All right, and finally, which do you prefer? The reuse of existing buildings, uh, hit button one, and the demolition of existing buildings and redevelopment of the campus, hit button two. Right, and there seems to be favor for demolishing existing buildings and redeveloping the campus. So 
this information is going to provide really useful feedback as the town council um, drafts its vision statement over the coming weeks. And you'll notice the questions that we um, gave you tonight are really um, things that could be incorporated into the vision statement directly. So we thank you for, for participating. Uh, as mentioned, we'll conclude tonight with um, some small breakout sessions. There are a lot of you here today, um, and this will hopefully um, divide you up into more manageable groups. Um, and can we can have some Q&A as well as some interactive exercises. Um, so in the back left, we have our um, west side concepts. So that'll be group one. Uh, in this corner, we'll have the east side concepts. And then um, those who are in the front rows, we ask that you um, remain seated and Todd will go through the online community survey results. And after 15 minutes, we will be rotating. And um, this is gonna be set up a little bit differently than a traditional public hearing in that um, you know, we really want questions to be kind of asked on an informal basis. If you have a comment that you would like to get on the record, we encourage that you send an email or letter uh, directed to Todd and his email address is, uh, and mailing address are listed here. So with that, I'll ask that the first three rows stay seated to be in group one um, those who are seated on the left-hand side that aren't in the first three rows, if you could proceed to the back left, and those who are in um, beyond three rows um, on the right-hand side, go back here. So, yeah. Someone's gonna walk. Hold on, I, I can't hear you very well with the. 